Our speaker tonight is obviously Mr. Cameron Babb. He was born in Columbia, Missouri and moved later to St. Louis, Missouri when he was about seven years old. He was a four-star player coming out of high school, which is really, really good. Um, had an injury his senior year, had an ACL tear, um, which probably would have been a five-star player um, because he was already in the top 100 players of the country right there already. Cam played five seasons with the Buckeyes and graduated with two degrees. He's got, had a bachelor's degree in communications and then a master's degree in kinesiology. He needed that one, didn't he? <laughs> Work on the knees. So, and is now, he's now pursuing a master's divinity at another college right now, but he's still working for Ohio State. Um, he was a four-time OSU scholar athlete and a four-time academic All Big Ten uh, honoree. So he's not just good looking, he's smart too, so. <laughs> he was voted a team captain twice. Not too many guys did that. A lot of guys get uh, voted team captain once. He was voted twice by his teammates. That's because he's a leader in who he was. Um, he's selected as Ohio State's third honoree for the Bill Willis Block O jersey, which is the jersey with the number uh, zero on it, and it's, it's basically for the Block O. It's actually a big honor, and it's given to the player who exhibits the Willis traits of toughness, accountability, and of highest character. So if you know the story of Ga uh, Cam, uh, he went through four knee surgeries, four ACL tears. Um, rehab for those are nine months to a year at each one of them. And, uh, and he played all years and he, and he made it through all that. And his story is an amazing one. So he really got, came to close to, to Christ in that third ACL tear. And uh, it, what happened was uh, after his fifth year, uh, obviously the, in the game versus Indiana, he, uh, him and CJ hooked up for a touchdown. And what happened in the end zone is something you just, you just don't see. Um, to me, it was a very profound uh, uh, thing. Uh, it really went way past football. And um, when the thing that really struck me the most is when, that, when he went into the end zone and to give glory to God and uh, to thank God, all his teammates gathered around him and put their hands, sorry, <laughs> and they put their arms around uh, to, to stop, to, to let him to have his time to honor God and, and until he was ready. And so um, it was quite an incredible moment. I want to give thanks to everybody that is here that's brought me here, but I also want to give thanks uh, to Jesus. And uh, I want to just take a minute, if we can all just bow our heads real quick and um, I'm just going to welcome him as, as uh, he talks through me, I guess you can say. Um, so, Holy Spirit, I welcome you. I just, I thank you for, for you. I thank you for how beautiful you are. I thank you for how wonderful you are. I thank you um, for the goodness of God through grace and mercy, through Jesus on the cross, and the fact that 2,000 years later you are still knocking at the door of our hearts, Father God, and that you are inviting us in to eat with you, Father God. So I just thank you for everybody that's in the room today. Um, I thank you for the one that will, will hear message. I, I pray that everybody would hear it and receive it no matter how long we've been walking with the Lord for, no matter if we don't walk with you, Jesus. I thank you that tonight is the night that we can turn our eyes and our hearts towards you. So Father, allow, as I talk, um, everybody that hears my voice, allow their minds and their hearts to be fixated on how great and wonderful you truly are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Uh, man, so first off, Dwight, Tom, thank you guys for coming up to Columbus and uh, having paying for my lunch. They paid for my lunch, so uh, that was awesome. I was grateful for it, uh, but thank you guys for coming up and um, really just inviting me to come speak. Um, I heard there was a coach last year that came, and I hope uh, I can do as good as he did. Um, so again, my name is Cameron Babb. Obviously, you saw the video. Um, played for Ohio State from 2018 to 2022, um, and it was really a story that I did not write. Um, if I was 15, 16, 17 years old, I would have written it completely different. Um, I'd probably be making a lot of money right now, um, drafted, playing for, I was a Cowboys fan growing up because my dad, um, sadly, I would like to say sadly, we were struggling a little bit, we're struggling, but I'm more of like a Texans fan now, Cardinals, Bills, Jets, I'm all over the place now, um, so uh, exactly, free agent, free agent. Bengals, Bengals fan, yeah, but I like to watch the Bengals. Um, so yeah, but I really, uh, what's on my heart tonight is really just share my story. Um, but hopefully, 
not talk about me as much. Um, but I hope that you would hear again the story of this man, Christ Jesus, that got on the cross, um, suffered all things, um, the only innocent one that's ever lived. Um, a lot of people, they look at, you know, me or you look at, we look at each other and say, oh, that's a good person right there. That's a great person. Um, but as I read the Bible and as I look at myself, as I know the thoughts that I've had, the, the actions that I've had, um, if you saw my whole life from the moment I was born to now, you'd probably think uh, a little bit differently about me. And you'll say, dang, how can God use a man like that? So I'm no different than the worst, worst person that's ever lived because even if he's done a, he or she has done a certain action, I've thought probably that same exact thing. And the only difference between me and somebody that doesn't uh, know Jesus is, is Jesus. I have gotten the privilege and the opportunity just as he reached his hand to me to put my hand out with my weak, the weakest attempt that I could possibly give him and just he grabbed my hand and he pulled me out from the depths of my own sin Almost like I want to share a story real quick before I get into my story. There's a story that we all know. It's, uh, I've shared it the last time I've talked recently. It's a story about the, the disciples and they're on a boat. Um, again, I'm paraphrasing, so I'm not going text by text or word by word. But uh, they're on this boat, and Jesus just got done talking, and they're not with them. Or Jesus isn't with the disciples. And the storm, they basically start storming, and waves are crashing, and everybody probably knows the story. Um, and Jesus appears to them on the water. Um, and uh, one of the disciples, Peter, he sees him, but he doesn't recognize him. They don't recognize that's Jesus. And so he says, Jesus, if this, is, if this is you, command me to come out to the water. And what does Jesus say? He says, come. But what does it take for, for Peter to walk to Jesus? It takes faith. To be able to come to him, he has to step out. So what does he do? He gets out and he steps on this, this water. He's the first person outside of Jesus himself that I know that's walking, that's standing on water, right? But what is he doing when he's, he's standing on this water? He's looking at the eyes of this beautiful man. Maybe not in appearance at the time, but he's beautiful in the way that he lives and just the God that he is, he's beautiful. So he's looking at him and he's taking a step closer and closer, still looking at him, taking a step. But all of a sudden, some rain probably smacks him the wind crashes against him, and so he starts shaking, starts shaking, and he becomes more concerned with the things that are going on around him than with the man, the one that saved him, the one that called him on. If you read the Bible earlier, and he says, I will make you fishers of men. He took a fisherman, and he made him one that later he would say, you will be the one that you, I will build my, my rock, or you will be the, the rock that I build my church on, basically, in a sense. A normal Jew, and nobody really knew. Probably did some bad things like, like Cam, right? And so he's looking at Jesus, and as he's taking a step, the wind smacking him, he starts to sink because he's concerned with everything in his life. And he's sinking, and he's sinking, and he's sinking. All of a sudden, he's all the way under the water. He's probably more scared than he's probably ever been at that point. Possibly, I don't know what else he's been through. Right? And as he's under the water, he sees a hand reach out into the water. And what he's doing, he grabs Jesus' hand. And what does Jesus do? He picks him up, and he probably, he probably hugs him. Peter probably just hugs him. And then Jesus says, oh, you of little faith. Oh, you of little faith. The same one that just got up and walked on the water. Again, I think he's the, the first person outside of Jesus that I've heard of that have, has walked on water. But he says, you have little faith. So what is he doing? Why did he sink? It's because he took his eyes off of him. He took his eyes off of him. And my whole life, up until the age of 19, 20 years old, I never had my eyes on him. But he had his eyes on me the whole time. He has his eyes on you the whole time. He has his eyes on these kids that are out here doing whatever they're doing. Not a care in the world because they're young. They think life's going to be forever. Not knowing that there's a God right here that's just waiting for them to see him. It's like in a relationship, so many people, we come to Jesus, we're asking, if you would just give me this, if you would just give me this, 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 and this, then I'll follow you. My life is so bad, I don't have this. But we're missing the whole point. This life that we live right now, it's not about right here and right now. But he came and he died. He, he humbled himself enough to become a man. He was born of a virgin, a baby. What's the most innocent and the most precious thing in this world today? 
that can't defend itself. He became that baby to where he had to be looked after by his mother and his father, his earthly father, right? Got him in the flesh. And then he grew up, he grew up, he grew up for one purpose and one purpose alone. So the human beings that love their sin could be freed by the grips of sin. And so that someday, 2,000 years later, he knew Cameron Babb was going to need him. He was going to need him. So he got up on that cross. And the same ones that killed him, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They don't know who they're killing. They don't know that I love them more than anybody else could. More than that job, more than that touchdown, more than your spouse, more than anybody, your children. And he's here today to call you home. The beautiful thing. So it's like, okay, how do we get to heaven, right? Heaven came down to us. Heaven came down to us. And not only did he come down, not only is the Holy Spirit here, but he's living in me and in you. If you have him, he's in you. God is in you and in me. And so the, the testimony that you just saw is nothing of me. The perseverance that I had getting past four after that touchdown, technically five ACLs, it was nothing of me. It was only so that I could get up and proclaim about this Jesus that I've gotten to know even just a little bit, just a little bit. Because the beautiful thing about Jesus is he's so eternal. And you have to keep me on time, too. I know I got to get into my story. No, you're good. You're good. He's so eternal. So I don't care if you've been following Jesus for a thousand years. You're still farther away from him. Like he's this eternal God, right? So it's like if I've been knowing him for, I've only been following him for four years, right? So I haven't even, if there's steps all the way up to Jesus, I haven't even really flinched. I haven't even taken the first step to getting to know him. Because he's that amazing, he's that beautiful, he's that wonderful, and we'll, we'll never have, I will never have arrived there to where I know everything about him. I believe that with the depths of my heart, he's so amazing, so beautiful, he's so wonderful. Even when I'm with him, I will still be in awe, and I don't, I don't understand it. How can you be this good? How can you be this loving? So this Christian walk, this walk to go out and to create disciples, to grab the little one, to grab the old one, and to tell them about this Jesus, and then walk with them. The whole point is to take our eyes off of ourselves and to look at him. Because the longer we look at ourselves, we'll drop the ball every single time. Because Cameron within myself, I can't do anything. I can't do anything to earn his love or to take away his love. But it's a free gift. Salvation is this free gift. And so many people turn their back on him time and time again, just like me. So right now you see a man up here that's talking about Jesus, but it is a broken man without him. It is a man that sees his sin and that in my sin, all I can do, even when I want to run away because I know my sin, he's a father that just draws me to him every single time. And you just say, son, daughter, come run, come run, in, run into my arms like a little kid. Right. And so I didn't recognize this and I still don't recognize him truly. But at the age of 19, I had my dreams and my hopes all on football. Since the age of eight years old. People that saw me run and score touchdowns and run fast and do all these great things. I would like to say because of my hard work, but I was just naturally talented a lot of the times. When you said Cam Babb, the first thing they thought was football player. And so from that moment on, from the age of really 10, when I really recognized I was good, I put my identity in that. And what others said about me and how I played on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, whatever day it might have been, right? So then when you take that away from me, it's gone. Who am I? When you take that job away from you, who are you? That relationship, who are you? And I, it's sad to say, but even family, who are you? Because we will all close our eyes, we will all die. I don't know when, I don't know how, but it will happen. And we will come face to face with him. Right now, we all have a picture in our mind of Jesus and what he looks like and who he is. But on that day, we will see him for who he is in glory and in beauty. And he, I don't know what he'll ask, truly. I don't know what he'll say. I don't even know if I'll be able to look at him in his eyes because he's that bright, that magnificent. But the question will be, do you know him? And then a step further, does he know you? Of course he knows you, but does he know you? Has he, has he allowed you to be broken before him to where it's not just this fake cam, put your name right there, this fake cam that's coming up to him. And I'm you know, going to church on Sunday. I got the nice polo on or jeans or whatever you guys wear, 
But no, I come to him when it's just me and him and he sees everything. And I can get on my knees or however you are with the Lord and I can just, Jesus, have mercy on me. You are so beautiful. You are so wonderful. Because I think most of the time, somebody told me this, most of the time we minister to other people, but we forget him. How many times do we minister to him and tell him how wonderful he is without asking for anything? No agendas. It's just Jesus, you are just you. And I thank you. I don't have all the answers, but I have you. I might be struggling right now, but I have you. People died for this Bible that we read, but they had you. And this is the God that we get to serve. And so I go into college after I tore my first ACL, not knowing this at all. I know some of you heard my story in the back, so hopefully this doesn't get boring for you. Basically, nine to 12 months of rehab. Don't have any confidence because I just tore my ACL. I'm at a new school with new, uh, you know, friends and stuff from all over the country. Um, do a drill, put my foot on the ground, boom, I tear my other ACL, right? So that's two ACLs. And at this point in my life, I was like, okay, it's freshman year. Um, I don't know the playbook at all, for real. It's a lot going through my mind. I got to get right with the playbook. So it's time for me, okay, I can get in the playbook and rehab and catch up a little bit, get stronger, faster. But in the midst of that, when we were playing, it was always football over here, practicing all the healthy guys, but then the injured guys were always over here. So when was the only, when the, I, felt, I felt isolated many, many times. So when was the only time that I could feel like I was with the team? Thursday nights, Friday nights, and Saturday nights. Sometimes like Tuesdays maybe, sometimes. Sad to say. And now the world will tell you, if you just do this, you'll feel good. If you just chase this dream, again, I'm not telling you not to chase your dreams or anything like that. But so many times we have our dream above him. And what I've learned and what I am learning is he will not play second in our lives and in our hearts. He will not. He's a jealous father. He's jealous for you, which is beautiful. He, he wants you, right? And so I'm going out on High Street of Columbus and uh, I'm enjoying my time. I know there's little ones in here, or smaller, you know, not so little, but younger kids in here. But the reality is this world will offer you all these things. So when you leave your parents' house, they will offer you these things. They will offer you the drugs, they will offer you the alcohol, they will offer you the sex, they will offer you whatever it is to give you, and they will say it feels good, it will take the pain away, and you can have fun with it. But like I said in the back earlier, you will, dig your, you will dig yourself into a hole so deep that you can't get yourself out. And so me, I'll go on high street and I would indulge in all these things, indulge in everything I could, and have fun. I'm telling you, I was having fun while I was doing it. But like I said in the back as well, it says in the Bible, sin is pleasurable for a season. For a season of your life, it's enjoyable. And then you get to a point when you recognize, dang, what am I doing? Who have I become? So I lay my head on the pillow at night and I would just cry silently because I had a roommate. Or I'd go into the bathroom, I would turn on the shower and I would cry with the pain inside of me. But I would walk into the Woody Hayes Athletic Facility, which is where we practice, and I would have a smile on my face. And people would ask me and they would think, you're so strong, you're so, you're so, you're so awesome because you keep coming back day after day after day. But they didn't really know what was going on in my heart. So just like you, you may walk, get up even in your house every single day, but you might be going through something he might put on this fake smile, but the one that really knows is you and Jesus. So the time of coming to Jesus and trying to look good and look perfect is over with. These kids, another camp band that was ni that's 19 years old right now, that's dying in his sin, he needs us. He needs us to get close to Jesus and to see Jesus so that when somebody comes to him and he has all these problems in his life and he's going down this dark path, the only solution that we can give them is him. Because there's nothing else. There's nothing else. If you give Cam Bab all these programs and all these great things that are great, eventually Cam Bab will run into more problems. Eventually Cam Bab will die someday and he will see Jesus. And this whole time, I forget the verse that's on the, on the pamphlet, um, if you want to look at it, but it mentions hope. It brings up this, this idea of hope, and everything that we search for in this life gives us this momentary hope, this momentary hope. Like, okay, here's, here's hope for, for an hour, here's hope for a few weeks, here's hope for a year, but then it crashes down, and then you gotta try to find hope in another place. 
But Jesus promises, I'm going to give you everlasting, eternal hope in me and my death that you can rest. Yes, you will, you will face trials and you will face tribulations, but you can rest in the finished work of the cross. That I got up on the cross and I shed my holy and perfect blood. Like I said earlier, he was the only innocent one. Everybody else, it should have been me on the cross. It should have been you on the cross. But he said, I love them so much that I'm going to do it myself. Knowing that they will reject me over and over and over and over again. Right? And so I do a year, year of rehab again. So this is on my third, second or second, going on to my third. Same exact drill. I get up to the line. I'm in my mind. I'm like, dang, this is the same drill I just did. I've been working a year. Put my foot in the ground. Boom. Snap. Go down again. This is the third one. I came in with Chris Olave, if you guys know him, and some other guys. I throw my helmet down. I tell Chris, I'm like, I'm done. I can't do it no more. I go into the training room. I'm crying. It's just me because they're still practicing. Not thinking a thing about Jesus at all. So as I talk about this too, I want you to think in your life, one of the times that you've walked away. It mentions in the Bible too, there's a, there's a time where it mentions we, they left their first love. Where believers have left their first love. So whether you know Jesus or you don't, some of us have left our first love. Right? So I tell Coach Day and Coach Harlow, I'm going to go home to try to figure things out. They let me try to get on a plane. Or they give me a plane flight for later that evening or the next day, basically. So this was on a Thursday. I get a flight for Friday. Friday morning, Ohio State works fast. Um, go to get on this plane. They wouldn't let me on the plane, right? Plane takes off. They're like, oh, something happened in the system. We don't know what happened. They find out it wasn't anything on my end. It was on their end. So they buy another flight or give me book for another flight later that evening. It's on that same Friday. I Uber back to the dorms, planning to Uber to the airport again, so spending a lot of money on Ubers at this point. And as I Uber, I met a young man by the name of Darnell. He's about my age right now. And just like we have this mission of sharing the gospel with the kids, what was it, uh, pre-K to eighth grade, is that what it is? Well, I'm 19. But this young man had the boldness to share Jesus to a young man that was not listening at all. He was not listening, but he was, he was planting a seed and he was going to try to water it, believing and trusting that it's not his words, but it's Jesus, the love of Jesus that will convict this young man's heart and will show that, look, if you would just see that there's a God that loves you so much that he doesn't want you to just stay in your sin, but he's created a way for you to leave your sin and to turn towards him. Right. He's sharing the gospel with me. We pull up to the airport. He's like, man, can I pray for you? I'm like, sure, I've prayed before. I've prayed over my food, and you know, I've, you know, I've prayed with, uh, I got a grandmother, Gigi. I got to shout her out every time I uh, talk about her because she has a beautiful heart and loves Jesus, right? So, yeah, I prayed with Gigi before. He's like, okay, man, can, uh, can I reach back and touch your knee? And I'm like, sure, man, that's a little weird, but we can do it, right? <laughs> we can do it. I was like, I just met you five minutes ago. It's all right. It's all right. And as he, as he reached back and as he touched my knee, All the moments when I was looking at the things of this world, there was, a, there was a God that was looking down on me. And he saw me in the shower, and he saw me in the car, he saw me walking to class. He saw me, and as he touched my knee, I just felt God, the Holy Spirit, I just felt him wrap, it was like, it was like a little kid in the, in the rain or in the snow. And the only thing that can comfort him is God himself, and it's like he just wrapped himself around me, put me in this blanket, and just held me. He just held me. Before Darnell even said a word, he just held me. I had no other answer at this point in my life. I had no other answer. I couldn't look to the left. I couldn't look to the right. I couldn't look forward. I couldn't look backward. I've tried football. I've tried the girls. I've tried the drugs. I've tried the alcohol. I've tried everything I possibly could. The only thing I could do now is look up. That's it. Not, not just with my eyes, but with my heart. Because I had every, I didn't have any, I needed something. I needed him. And so at that point, when I experienced the presence of the Holy Spirit right there in that car, it wasn't just something that I wanted anymore. It was something that I needed. Jesus, if this is you, if this is that God that, that I've heard about my whole life, I went to church, I heard about him my whole life, but I thought I knew him. If this is, if this is the God that Gigi told me about, I need you. Because everything that Darnell started to, pray after that. Nobody was with me. He started to say things about times when I was in the shower, times when I was, you know, by myself and nobody was there. So how could Darnell know? 
And I'm telling you, we talk about the church. We talk about a building, the church. God is everywhere. He sees everything. So how we act in a church is no different than how we act on a Saturday night or on a Thursday night. Or in the house when it's just you and your wife or when I'm in uh, my dorm with just me and my roommate, how I treat them. It's no different. He's everywhere and he sees everything. But he wants your heart. He wanted my heart. But he had to break me down physically. He had to break me down so that I didn't just want football, but I want him. Because he doesn't play second because he loves us too much to play second. He loves us too much to play second. And so at that moment, uh, Darnell invited me to church that next week. I go to church, um, sit in the front row, uh, very nervous, very timid, uh, and the pastor preaches the gospel. And he says, today you have a choice. If you're gonna serve God, if you're gonna serve Jesus, serve Jesus. If you're gonna serve the devil, serve the devil. But you can't eat off of two plates. Choose today who you will serve. But there's a grace and there's a mercy and there's a love that is offered to you. And to know this man, Christ Jesus, is better than anything that this world can give you. But he's here with his hand out. Will you grab him? Right? And so I try to grab him. I try to repent of my sins. I try to give him my heart, surrender my life, surrender my heart. I didn't even know how to do that. So now I go through a time span of a month going out on Saturday, but going to church, getting convicted. So I like to say this. Somebody told me this. It's almost like you have too much sin to enjoy this God that you encountered but you have too much of this God that you encountered to go back to the sin you once loved. See, the thing about God is, it's almost like I heard this guy, Paul Washer, is a preacher, he said, if you get smacked by a bus and you live from it, you'll come out getting smacked by a bus a little differently. You'll be a little different after that, right? So how much bigger is God than that bus? So how can I experience Jesus and continue to live the life that I once lived after I encountered the one that created the universe. You can't. Because you can't ter- serve two masters. You can't. You're going to end up hating both. You love one and hate the other, and then love the other and hate the one. So I had to choose. And it was a moment in my bathroom, going back to the bathroom. I don't know why it was the bathroom. <laughs> I turned on some worship music got on my knees or however I did it. I probably said a lot of things. Probably cried out and did a lot of different things. But I knew at that moment, God had my whole heart. It was, I entrusted, I, there was a cliff and I said, Jesus, I'm gonna jump off this cliff and I'm gonna trust you with my whole life. It's no longer me, but it's you. It's no longer I, but it's Christ in me. But I desire, I need you to fill me because I need you to change me so I can see you, so that I can tell others about this God that I've experienced. But not only just so I can tell people, but so I can know you myself. Because everybody has an image or a word of who Jesus is. But he wants to talk directly to you. He wants to speak directly to you. No matter how old you are or how young, it doesn't matter. No matter how, how much you think you know, there's more. There's more. And so I go from that, and I'm going to score touchdowns for Jesus. I'm going to, you know, score about 20 touchdowns in my mind and go to the NFL and talk about Jesus, right? A year from that, tear my right ACL. So now it's right, left, left, right. This is the same one I tore in high school. This was like four years ago. I'm like, dang, right? But there's something different in this moment. Yes, it hurt. Yes, there was pain. Yes, I didn't want that to happen. I didn't. I go into the training room and I look behind me maybe five minutes later and I just see a swarm of people coming in. Teammate after teammate after teammate after teammate. All of a sudden I'm on this training table and people are surrounding me and they ask, okay, Cam, we'll pray, let's pray. Because no way this just happened again. No way. We've seen the work that you've put in, we've seen everything. No way it just happened again. But what's the next step for, for a believer? This is the moment when you tell them about Jesus. This is the moment when you tell them about this God that has shown you compassion. I just told them earlier. It's like when I look at you guys, it's like, Jesus, how do you see them? Some people he looks at, he looks at into the crowd, he looks into their hearts, and it's like he has compassion on them because he sees them like sheep without a shepherd. But he also says, I leave the 99 to go find the one. 
He leaves it. He leaves the 99 to go find the one. And when one sinner repents of their sin and they turn to Jesus, heaven rejoices. Because there was a price that was paid for you and for me. And so many of us in America have got complacent because we've heard of Jesus our whole lives, but we don't really know him. And I'm speaking to myself. We don't really know him the way he desires us to know him. And so this message to you today is just to encourage you to go after him. And when you fall, to recognize that there's a father that's right there. Just hug him and never let go. And when you do let go, he will grab you. And so I told my teammates about this man. Look, I know this just happened, but there's a hope that's in me that no matter what happens in my life, my hope is no longer in what we can see, but it's in what we can't see. So yes, it was through that testimony. Yes, it was through the Darnell. But it's also going back to if we would just open up the scripture and we would read with the open heart, Jesus, I want to see you from Genesis to Revelation. I want to see Jesus because the whole Bible is about Jesus. It is about man that has fallen short every single time. Every single time. If I was God, I'd be like, nah, they can't do it. I'm done. I'm done. I've tried to love them. I've tried everything I can, but they keep, they keep choosing other things than me. But he came as a man for you. And I like to say this, and I truly believe in my whole heart. If you were the only one to say yes to Christ, out of all the billions of people that have ever lived, all the billions of Christians, if you were the only one to say yes, he would have still gotten up on that cross and still paid that price. If nobody said yes, not a single person, I believe he would have done it all over again just to give us the chance to say yes to him. Because without him, we have zero chance. The Bible is not about us. It's not about anything that we can do. It's everything about him and what he has done and who he is. He was the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So if he's the same God that we read about in the Bible, he's the same God today. The only things that change is us. Society changes. And society has changed so much that they tell people what to believe and who they are. When God is saying, if you look at me, I will show you who you are. Because you can't know who you are without the one that created you. So the beginning of life is death. And I mean that not physically, but spiritually. When Cam Bad, when I, when I gave my life to Jesus, the sign of baptism, you go under the water and you rise again. The sign of what's happening inwardly, basically expressed outwardly, basically. I die to myself in my life. What I think I should you know, do in my life or what's best for me. And I rise to new life with him. And then a year later, sorry, I'm jumping all around, you get to score that touchdown. And I get to profess about this man, this God that I have gotten to know, and that I desire to know. So I get on my knees, and that was for the times when I was in my room, and it was just me and him. Because what does he say? So many people, we do things, and now, okay, let's post it to the world. Let the world see it. But what does Jesus do? He says, when you pray, Shut the door behind you and go to your heavenly father and pray in secret. Pray in secret. Jesus, what did he do? He would do miracles, but then he would often, it says he often withdrew to the wilderness to spend time. To, I, well, he didn't say to spend time, but often withdrew to the wilderness. And you ask, okay, what was Jesus doing in the wilderness? There's no music. He doesn't have to repent for any sins. So what was he doing? And I heard another man say this. Could it not just be that he loved the father so much that he just wanted to withdraw? And just be with the Father. How many times do we withdraw to be with him? Yes, yeah, so that he can pour his love on us, so that we can go out and make disciples and, and do whatever he's called us to do. But how many times do we just go to just be with him because he is him? So that is my encouragement to you today. And that is the, the journey that I'm on. Psalm 27, 4. David says this. He says, my one desire, my one desire is that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all of the days of my life. And then it says this, to behold his beauty and to inquire in his temple, to ask questions. How many times we just, oh, this is God. We know the gospel. We know he got on the cross. We know this. We've heard it our whole life. But there's depths to it. There's depths. Read the same scripture for eternity. If you have one scripture, one verse, John 3, 16, 
if you had that one verse and that's all you had, I bet you we could do a lot with that one verse forever. I bet you we could. Because there's no end to them. There's no end to them. So I, I'm saying all this to say and to ask the question, what's on your heart? Who is on your heart? What's on your mind? What do you think about throughout the day? What are you chasing after? Because today, right now, 2024 in America, we need Jesus. We've always needed him. We need him. And believers like myself have fallen short. And we will always fall short. But we have fallen short not to just tell people about Jesus, but to just see Jesus. Because if we just see Jesus for who he is in the dark, when it's just us and him, then everything else will take care of itself. But we see all the outside. We see the ministry. We see the, everything that he's doing. We want to be a part of it, which is great. But I don't want Jesus for that. And sometimes my heart, yeah, you can see, I can see myself, oh, yeah, I like that. I want to do that. But it's like, okay, let's rewind. Let's slow down. It's like a husband and wife. You know, again, I'm not married or, you know, a friend. If I, if I wanted to be a friend with somebody just because of everything he can give me, I'm a pretty bad friend. So for each and every one of you, does Jesus not just call you a son or a daughter? But does he call you a friend? Does he trust you? Does he trust you? He loves everybody. Somebody told me he loves everybody. But he doesn't trust everybody the same way. He doesn't trust everybody. Two more things and I'm done, I promise. Judas, the one that betrayed Jesus. He healed more people than I've healed. He's probably casted out more demons than I've ever, I've never, you know, casted out demons, right? So he's, he's done more. When he was walking with Jesus, he did more. He was with the 12. He was a part of the 12. He heard Jesus the same way. He did all these works. But when it came down to it, he didn't really know him. And he chose the things of this world over Jesus. Many times, me, the church, whoever it may be, but I'm pointing at me. We try to do all these things and we think we're doing him a favor when he wants you. He doesn't want the things that you can, he doesn't want the things that you can do for him because you can't do anything for him. He can do it all himself if he needs, but he wants you and he wants me. So that brings me to a story of a woman. And again, I love my Gigi and I'm so uh, thankful for women they have truly, in my opinion, in my opinion, in my life, have been the strength in my life, behind the scenes in prayer, and, be and behind the scenes of knowing Jesus, so that a young Cam, when he's doing stupid stuff, I have this praying grandmother that has prayed for me and, and watched over me. But there's a woman in the Bible that I look up to. Her name is Mary. Not the mother of Jesus, but another Mary. People call her Mary of Bethany. I think she's mentioned three times, maybe twice. I'm not too sure. But there's one story. It's about her and her, uh, her sister, Martha. And uh, Jesus comes. Again, God in the flesh. He's coming. He's right there. It's like Jesus right in front of you. You know he's Jesus. You believe him to be God. So he comes to your house. What you going to do? You're going to clean up, make sure, you know, this vacuum, make sure the table's clean, right? Jesus is sitting there talking. He's sitting, right? I just picture he's just chilling. The Bible that we have, it's literally like pouring out of his mouth because he is God. The words that we read, they, he is him. He's him. And so that he's just talking to the disciples. It says, Mary Bethany, she's sitting right here, just looking at him. Just listening to every single word that's coming off of his tongue, just listening. And her sister, Martha, she's cleaning, she's probably cooking, probably again paraphrasing doing all these different things, right? She looks at Mary and she's like, Jesus, why don't you tell her to help? She's not helping me. But what's the difference between Mary and Martha? Mary saw Jesus for who he truly was. And so there's nothing more valuable than what he's telling me. There's nothing more valuable than it. All the work that you can give him, you can do for him. It's, it's, I'm not gonna say it's not valuable, because it is. But it's not more valuable than him. Right. 
And so what does Jesus tell Martha? Paraphrasing. He says, Mary, your sister, she's chosen the good thing, the eternal thing. That's what she's chosen. See, because what you do, the work, all the things that I, you know, I do, you know, again, this is paraphrasing. That touchdown, that touchdown within itself fades. Ten years from now, 20 years from now, people might forget it. Who won the national championship 10 years ago, 13 years ago? You don't know. Who was the MVP of that game? You don't know. Right? But yet we have a Bible, and it's described as these words are powerful. They're sharper than a two-edged sword, and they bring life. They change me from the inside out. And yet me, I'm talking to me as well, we neglect it daily for other things. And so today is the day where we can turn to him and be like Martha or Mary. And we can look at him through his scripture and through time alone with him so that when we do go out, we can tell the world not just about this religion, but we can tell him about the person Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit that we have gone to know in the secret place. When it's just you and him and he sees all your scars and he sees your hurt and he sees your pain. That is my heart cry. That is my goal that I found out when I was 19 years old, when I was 20 years old and an Uber driver. And he said, look, I know you, you see your sin. I know you do. There is no sin more stronger than his blood and what he's done on the cross. So what I encourage you to do, there's a song. I don't know what it's exactly called. It's basically talking about the blood, and his blood makes me whiter than snow. So tonight, as we all go home, whenever you get alone, I encourage all of us to turn to Jesus in our sin, to repent of our sin. I'm faced towards my sin, and I decide I'm going to turn my back on it, and I'm going to turn towards you. And I'm believing that you're going to draw me near. It's like a magnet. You're just going to draw me near to yourself. And in that, you will be embraced with a hug and with a love knowing that he's paid the price for you and that he cares about you and he desires you. What kind of God do we serve that he thinks about man? The big things in your life, but also the little. He wants to be not just in your life, but he wants to have your life. So the, the call of the gospel is to die to ourselves, to pick up our cross, and to choose him every single day. And when we don't choose him, to recognize that and to run towards him. So that America, so that the world can see Jesus for not who we think he is, but for who he is. So again, I just want to thank you guys for letting me speak today. But I pray that you would just see Jesus in your own life um, like I've seen him in mine. Thank you. Good. Good, man. Heavenly Father, I just I thank you for the opportunity that we have to serve you in this life. You've blessed each one of us in so many different ways. And we can look at material things, but material things isn't the, isn't the main focus, Lord. It's what you do in our hearts. And when we find that truth in your word that you truly love us, that you truly died on the cross, that we may have eternal life. I pray now tonight that each one of these go out of here tonight, each one here, each family represented here, that your spirit would flow through their hearts and bring revival, bring revival in their hearts that they may know the true Son of God who gave himself for their sin. We're all our, sin we're all our sinners saved by grace. And it's only by your grace can we, can we live this life. Mm -hmm. So Lord, thank you again for being with us tonight, with this banquet, with these special people here tonight. And we thank you for all that you are doing in, in this world in these last days because you said you will not return. Jesus will not return until all have heard the gospel. And if any country in, in, in this world is so blessed with the gospel, it's right here in the United States, mm -hmm. we will have no excuse when it comes to that day when he takes us home. Help us to know where our true home is. And it's with you, Lord. Thank you. We praise you. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Thank you all for coming. If you want to, there's a box in the back. If you want to drop the cards off in there.
um, or anything that's uh, any questions, whatever. Thank you all for coming. Appreciate it. God bless.